he's going to quit. We thought he was crazy, Ferdy, but he quit. Ferdy, I first met Ali in the Olympic trials in 1960. A lot of people don't know this, but uh, there was a kid from the Army named Alan Hudson who'd won the heavyweight in the service championship three years in a row. A black kid from the Army that could really fight. They brought him down to 78 to fight then Cassius Clay in the trials. And Alan Hudson had f Clay on the floor in round one, but Ali got up. Then Cassius Clay. Matter of fact, one thing that I wish I'd have done, I still have the program at home with my picture in it. I wish I'd have had Ali autograph that Cassius Clay. <laughs> yeah, it would have yeah, been worth a lot. Yeah, well, yeah, never did. Well, Emmanuel and Judge Mills Lean, thanks a lot. Muhammad Ali versus George Foreman. The Rumble in the Jungle, 1974, round eight. On April 28, 1967, five weeks after his ninth successful title defense and just one hour after his refusal to be inducted into the U.S. Army, Muhammad Ali is stripped of his title by the New York State Athletic Commission. Each of the nation's other boxing jurisdictions quickly follow. Although still recognized as the legitimate champion by Japan and Great Britain, Ali is barred from traveling outside the United States. Three and a half years later, a conflict of personalities, politics, money, and intrigue presents Ali with a chance to fight again. He does so in Atlanta on October 26, 1970, and knocks out top contender Jerry Quarry in three rounds. But it would take 17 fights, two setbacks, and four years before Ali earns a second opportunity to regain the heavyweight crown. His opponent is a fellow Olympic gold medalist, 26-year-old undefeated champion George Foreman, who will meet Ali in Kinshasa, Zaire, on October 30th, 1974. America is turned upside down in 1974 as three articles of impeachment are voted out of the House Judiciary Committee, forcing President Nixon's resignation on August 9th. As the nation catches its breath, a black man fresh from the penitentiary using guile, skill, diplomacy, and an unstoppable ego puts together the sports event of the decade, the Rumble in the Jungle. When Foreman announces his willingness to meet Ali in mid-1974, Muhammad demands a $5 million guarantee, creating an opening for Don King, who finds an emerging country badly in need of publicity, Zaire, and a president, Mobutu, willing to dig deep into the state's treasure. A street corner bully in Houston's bloody Fifth Ward, the Job Corps turns Foreman's life around. Inspired by his then hero, Muhammad Ali, Foreman grabs Olympic gold in 1968 and puts together an unassailable professional record, including early round knockouts of Joe Frazier and Ken Norton. Once again, Ali is an overwhelming underdog, and once again, Ali's luck comes into play. This time, it is Foreman who is cut over his eye in training. The fight is postponed for weeks, and Ali uses this time to work the people, hitting the streets like a politician. Foreman, whose surly, brooding disposition is reminiscent of Sonny Liston, retreats to his hotel penthouse. At the training camps, Zaireans appear with their drums, chanting, Ali, Bumaye, Ali, Bumaye, Ali, kill him. So... Tom, we're going to talk about that great night in Africa when everything came together. Don King, who took an incredible amount of negotiating and an incredible amount of, of uh, technical know-how to go to uh, a nation who had just been stripped clean by the Belgians. The nation of Zaire was the Belgian Congo. When the Belgians left, they took everything. And they, they just really, literally rebuilt everything. They rebuilt a stadium. We, we, uh, they didn't have taxis. They sent off and bought huge Mercedes cars for taxis. It was like uh, um, Alice in Wonderland, what happened there. And what we're going to see here is pure Ali. He thought of it himself, he executed it himself, and he orchestrated this fight the way he wanted to. We didn't. Angelo didn't. Nobody in the corner did. We were shocked when he went to the ropes and started rope and dope. We're going to see. It. Here's rope and dope. Now, Judge, you tell me the punches that you see Foreman, if he's got anything on these punches. No, you can see they're just lumbering. Put the, he just kind of pushing him up there. George has got nothing right now. You can see he's really whipped. And Ali, you know, Ali's a smart guy. Why he, he's covering up, he's pushing his head down a little bit. And every now and again, he throws something. But Foreman's got nothing left. Nothing at all. And Tom, he talks to him all the time. He talks to him. Now, it's important for people to remember 
that when Ali went to the ropes, which he did at the start of the second round, not the first, but when Ali went to the ropes, he didn't just lay on the ropes taking punches. He blocked a lot of the punches with his forearms, he leaned back from others, and most importantly, he threw punches off the ropes. Throwing punches off the ropes, he won three of the first four rounds. Then and, in the fifth round, he started to tire, and of course he came back well, later well, on. You know, at the end of the fourth round, he came in to our corner and he said to us, no, I got him, I can knock him out anytime I want. Of course, Angelo said, why well, can you start? You know, <laughs> we had a huge rain cloud overhead. It was palpable. I mean, it felt like any moment you could just punch it and you get you get drowned by water, which happened after the fight. And we would have washed out the fight. And it Ali's luck again. Not a drop fell till it was over. When it was over, come on soon. So here we see Foreman going down without any chance of getting up. But he gets to nine. Now here's the, here's the dispute. He gets to nine, but he doesn't. Now he doesn't call ten, but he goes over. The fight's over. If he'd gone to ten. Then he has a chance to make it to the the uh, the corner because the bell sounds. That gives him 60 seconds more. Now I personally don't think it makes any difference. What, technically speaking, as a, a just a judge, without all the other fault at all, could he have made it? Should he have made it? When a judge gets to nine and the guy gets up, he's up. Well, you're quite right, and and you're right. You cannot prejudge it. If Foreman gets up by nine. And he, everything's off the deck except the, toe, the soles of his shoes. He's entitled to go back to the corner and see if he can get it together. Now, I agree with you. It might not have made the difference, but that's not the issue. The question is, was it, technical, was it done technically correct? And it was not. Well, uh, let, me, let me throw uh, something Tom. in on there. And, and that is that if you put a stopwatch to George Foreman on the canvas, I think he is on the canvas for 10 seconds. The closed circuit commentator picked up the count late Bob when, when he was down on the canvas at three the commentator was at one. Oh, I so see. you I know see. if if you're listening to the tv commentator yeah. Count to yeah, ten, yeah, 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 yeah. you have a problem yeah but you know the thing that's important too tom and you've raised an interesting point the fighter when a fighter goes down you're entitled to 10 counts Rarely is it 10 seconds. It might be 11, it might be 9, it might be 12. But when the fighter goes down and the fighter who's on the deck looks up at the ref and he sees 4, 5, 6, he's entitled to believe that the next is going to be 7. He gets up by 8 or 9, even if it's over 10 seconds, he's up oh, by I understand, 8. But what I'm saying is the ref didn't mix up the count. It was the TV commentator. I understand that. George Foreman wasn't listening to the TV commentator. He was listening to the referee. Exactly, right. And Zach got to 10. Yeah. If Zach got to 10, then he's technically correct. I, I believe, as all three of us, I think, are, are, and I think the world <laughs> agrees, it didn't make any difference whether he got up or not. He was a beaten fighter. He was beaten in his head. He was beaten in his heart. He was beaten in his guts. If he had been given 60 seconds, I don't know if he could have gotten off the stool. The George Foreman that came back was a totally different human being oh, than the was. George Foreman that got out, got you knocked got out. got that right. And uh, we entered into a whole new phase, phase of boxing. And Ali himself became, and this is what I want you to address, Tommy, because you spent so much time with him in the last few years. He became somebody else. He became internationally a hero, not national hero, not black hero, everywhere hero. What do you, I mean, how do you well, see that in this context? Muhammad Ali beating George Foreman was the classic sports fairy tale. It's the story of the handsome prince who was unfairly deprived of his crown coming back and regaining the throne. This is the story of Muhammad Ali's greatest in the ring triumph. After 10 years, Muhammad Ali was once again heavyweight champion. And how would we know that we were going to get sucked into another third country to have what looked to us like it was going to be an easy and foolish fight and turn out to be the fight of Ali's life where he thought he was losing his life? So the thrill of Manila was waiting for us down the road. Muhammad Ali versus Joe Frazier, fight three. The Thriller in Manila, 1975, round 14. In 1975, Muhammad Ali is savoring the riches of his return to the heavyweight championship. He is riding a tidal wave of popularity when his sometimes promoter, Don King, comes up with yet another third world country eager to gain the international spotlight, the Philippines. 1975 finds America in the depth of its worst recession since the late 1930s. America is ready for a diversion, and the thriller in Manila promises great entertainment, if not great boxing. 
Joe Frazier, who conquers Ali in their first fight, has apparently hit the skids. On January 22, 1973, Joe is bounced like a basketball by George Foreman in Kingston, Jamaica. And just one year later, Ali outpoints Frazier in a convincing decision. What a sensitive Frazier cannot stand, what tears his mind to shreds are Ali's clever taunting. Mocking his looks, his boxing style, his speech, and even his blackness. Ali finds a rubber gorilla and ends every press conference punching the black gorilla while chatting, I'm beating the gorilla in the thriller in Manila. Meanwhile, back at the presidential palace, Ali's domestic fortunes are in a free fall. Invited to meet Ferdinand and Imelda Marcos, Ali, a married man, shows up with his mistress, the radiant Veronica Porsche. Ferdinand observes, you have a beautiful wife, Mr. Ali. To which Ali retorts, yours ain't so bad either. Incensed, Ali's real wife, the striking six-foot-tall Belinda, boards a direct flight from Chicago to Manila, just days before the fight. Storming in from the airport, she marches into Ali's room, where she rips into a tirade. Then she leaves, boarding the same plane that took her there. The marriage now in tatters. Ali's once fun-filled trip has robbed him of intensive training. Terribly underestimating Joe Frazier, Ali, the two-to-one favorite, now faces his toughest challenge. Never in his most macabre nightmares can he imagine what hell awaits him in the ring. Well, hell is a small word to describe what we walked into. Daddy, I don't know if I can, I can tell you what it feels like to be a small tin roofed place with no windows. It was so hot. Imagine what it was, was for Frazier and Ali. And Ali goes out there thinking he's got an easy fight. And he pops him a really great right hand, nice left hook. And Frazier goes back on his haunches. We got him. But he can't follow it up. And Frazier just ducks and bobs and weaves and gets by. Four four rounds of that. Four rounds. Any time when we get back to the corner, it's hot hop time. Yeah, wasn't that right? Well, the next one's going to be easy. We think we're going on a little picnic here. Along about the fourth or fifth round, he gets him right over where we were standing, and he starts hitting, Fraser starts hitting him in the ribs. I mean, those bouncing shots, you know, like in the first fight in New York. And and I heard him say, you hear, you hear him say, because Ali keeps talking to him all the time, and they told me you were through, champ. And he says, they lied. They lied to you. And he, pow, he hits him right, right on the ribs. Like, wow, this thing is going to be serious. And then he takes over, Fraser takes over. And then he's coming back, in the, in the, and he keeps saying to us, hey, God, what's the matter with this guy? It's supposed to be an easy fight. This guy's for real. This guy's fighting hard. And then something happened to Ali. Something clicked in, and he started to fight. Look at it. Now watch Ali's long punches and how they bounce, bounce off, off of the face of Joe Frazier. You call it. Well, right now, he's where he doesn't want to be. He's inside where Frazier wants to be. But I think you're going to see the turning point in this round, Purdy, is when all of a sudden it becomes distance between the two guys. Right. Because when there's distance and Ali throws his punches at the right distance, like now, it's no contest. Now all of a sudden he's got the shorter man who has to get closer than Ali has to get to land the punch. And Ali has a real distinct advantage. The difference here is when all of a sudden Ali is able to separate himself with distance and starts throwing the punches at the right time. And all of a sudden he's able to catch Joe in the middle of those slips, in the middle of those bobs, stop in the middle. See how long those punches are? That's what you're, what, uh, you're talking about. The, the, this length of these long punches, but they're hard. They, they, you know, it looks like he just throw them out there, but those right hands are very hard. He can throw a hard right. Well, Ali was always underrated as a puncher. I mean, he's the only guy to knock out Oscar Bonavina. Frazier, a great puncher, couldn't do it. Ali was a big man. A lot of times he didn't sit down on his punches, but when he did, he was an underrated puncher. Well, he was sitting down this time because yeah, he, sure was. he wanted to put Frazier out. He, he did not want to just stop it. He wanted to put him out. Again, the difference is he's letting those hands go at the right distance right now. When he was allowing Frazier to get in close, obviously the fight was a lot tougher and more in favor of Frazier. When he punched the right distance, it was all Ali. Well, see, Ali is coming back to the corner saying, I don't think he's going to get up again. And if he does, I don't know if I can. I mean, he was like, you know, he's very funny in the corner. But he, he, was, he, he was so aware of where he was in the fight all the time. You couldn't lie to him. Yeah, I think it shows two things, that fight. Number one, Ali, when he was robbed or he lost those three and a half years of his career, quite honestly, he was never physically the same fighter. But he won two more titles because of his character. And it was the character 
that allowed him to go on in that fight.